seems like we've got a little bit of a problem with the order today, but we'll try to get that fixed here. Uh, there is a psalm, responsive psalm, after the first reading, and I trust that that's in your bulletin. Yes. The first reading for this Reformation Sunday is from Revelation chapter 14. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And now we pray responsibly from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, whatever it is away. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams may glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. How we behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth, he breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Now, the epistle for this day is recorded in the third chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the Alleluia and the Gospel. Shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia. We hear the gospel from John's 8th chapter, beginning at verse 31. We read in the name of our Savior and Lord. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? 
Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Uh, let us uh, remain standing for the singing of a mighty fortress.
Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Amen. Amen. Grace and mercy and peace be unto all of you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Dear justified ones, in the name of Jesus. You know, I've got a friend in a former parish. Uh, he's uh, in his 80s. And a few years ago, he, uh, he went to Oktoberfest in Munich, Germany. That was kind of always a dream of his. His wife didn't really want to go, so he went by himself. And... Uh, yeah, it was fun to hear him talk about it, and uh, it's quite a, quite a place. I mean, there's a lot of good beer, there's a lot of venues and big, humongous tents, a lot of music, a lot of celebration. But uh, there's another Oktoberfest that comes out of Germany, and uh, has to do with Martin Luther. That's what we're celebrating today. It's really the, actually the last day of October, but... We set aside the Sunday before that as Reformation Sunday, uh, but it is a Oktoberfest, a, a celebration, Reformation Festival. Now it's true that Martin Luther, uh, he drank beer, his wife even brewed beer. Uh, Martin Luther was a musician who wrote many hymns uh, that we sing in the church today and some innovations in the liturgy from the medieval world. And uh, yeah, because of what Martin Luther had brought to light, there's a lot of reason to celebrate, you know, to live in the gospel and to live in that freedom of which Jesus spoke about in the gospel. If the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. And so, yeah, we have our own Oktoberfest, the church's Oktoberfest. Martin Luther brought to light, kind of rediscovered the good news of salvation, kind of got covered up over the centuries and the dark centuries, where people had a lot of doubt and a lot of fear about how they related to God. Martin Luther brought forth the message of the gospel, the good news that our sins have been forgiven in Christ and that it's a free gift to be received by faith and that there's nothing that we could do in and of ourselves in order to merit that kind of salvation. We couldn't work it out on our own. We couldn't come up with it on our own agenda, but it is the gift of God. Yes, it's God's grace through faith, and it can only be received by faith. And so the Church of the Reformation was able to uh, set apart the pillars of the Reformation Church in that they celebrated grace alone, or scripture alone, which we talked about last week, grace alone, through faith alone, and it's all about Christ alone. So what Martin Luther did, did is that he put Christ back in the center, in the center of human history, in the center of the Bible, in the center of the church. He put it all right, put Christ back where he belonged. And so, yes, Christ alone. You know, I was uh, reading in a journal, one of our theological journals, there's a, a professor of homiletics or preaching, and he had an article in there about different ways that we might deliver the message. And so what he suggested was, you know, maybe you uh, ask a question, and then you propose a couple of false answers, you know, and kind of work that with the congregation, and then you come up and you bring them the right answer. Does that make sense? Let's try that maybe on this Reformation Day. 
try that strategy of delivering the message. And so let's take the question, um, how am I saved? How am I saved? That's a good question, right? That was a question that most certainly Martin Luther gave a lot of thought about. But also we recognize in the Gospels, like uh, a man came to Jesus one day, a rich young ruler, and he said, he asked the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then we also know that in the, um, the book of Acts, it was the jailer in Philippi who asked Paul and Silas the question, what must I do to be saved? So those questions have been asked, right? And on this Reformation Sunday, we recognize that Martin Luther most diligently sought out the answer to that question. And uh, I would trust that you have asked that question many times, right? At least once that you've asked that question. And I know that people today maybe don't ask that question or pursue that with the same in intensity that others have at different times in history because after all, when we talk about being saved, we might talk about what we do with the document on our computer, right? We save it, right? Or if you watch The Voice at all and they got the, uh, the competition between two singers and the one gets chosen and the other doesn't, uh, we know about how that singer could get saved, right? And we know about retirement and planning for retirement. We talk about saving for that, right? But this question has to do with uh, eternal salvation. You know, when we're done living our life here and we submit to the uh, inevitable of death, uh, what happens then? And what kind of guarantee do we have? Like, Hamlet said, to be or not to be, that is the question. And so, that's a question. How am I to be saved? Now, you know, we could come up with an answer like, well, you know, if I do more good things than bad things, I know I'm not perfect, but if I do more good things than bad things, and, uh, you know, weigh those against one another, then uh, if, I, if, the, if the good outweighs the bad, then I can be maybe more sure that I'm going to have eternal life with my Creator and Lord. That's how a lot of people might answer that question. You know, and if the righteous judge, you know, looks at that scale and sees that the good outweighs the bad, well, then maybe... There's hope for me. That might be one answer that people come up with. Another thing is uh, kind of closely related to it, like, you know, I know I've got, you know, mistakes that I've made, but, you know, like when you got in trouble in elementary school and your teacher made you write like 500 times that you won't do this again, that that maybe makes satisfaction for the wrong that you did. And so uh, we, might, uh, we might think that we can somehow atone for our own mistakes. You know, like Martin Luther, the early Martin Luther, he would lay his body on a cold slab on the ground in order to kind of punish himself because he thought that's how he could get rid of or make atonement for his sins, his guilt, and that maybe he could make God feel sorry for him and show his pity toward him. You know, it didn't do the trick for Martin Luther to answer that question in those ways because what always kind of loomed behind inside of him was this question of how do I know that I've done enough? How do I know that the good that I've done is going to outweigh the evil that I've done? How do I really know that? And so, you know, a lot of people, they try to answer that question with those kinds of answers, but 
Does it really do the trick for them? Does it really give them the assurance and the comfort? Especially when you look at this Romans chapter 3 passage, you see, that's where Martin Luther kind of came to the answer, the right answer, that made all the difference for him. The text here, Paul's letter to the Romans and to all of us, where he says that no flesh, no human being will be justified by the deeds of the law. That no one, no one can stand right with God on the basis of the law. What he is commanded to do and what he is demanded to do. No one, not me, not you, not Martin Luther, nor anyone else in the world. That salvation is a gift. A gift from God himself. And a gift that can only be received by you and me. By believing. By faith in what God has done. That's why he asked the question in Romans, can we boast? No, we can't. We can't boast. Because salvation is a gift from God and it's free to all who believe. You see, that was what the Old Testament prophets had said, and we heard it not too long ago in the prophet Habakkuk. He said that the just will live by his faith. The just will live by his faith. Another prophet, Isaiah, said, all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. How can we present that to God? But the just, those who are justified, will live by their faith. And that's why Paul can say that, yes, salvation is the gift from God to be received by faith. The Apostle Paul wrote that um, what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature God did in sending his son in the likeness of sinful man and condemned sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be met in us. Yeah that the requirements are met in us because of what Christ has done. Grace alone, through faith alone, and it's all because of Christ alone. So that's the right answer. The answer that the Apostle Paul so clearly gives us here, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested Apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. That's why Jesus says the work of God is this, to believe in the one whom he has sent. Believing makes all the difference, right? Right? whether we reject God's gift or whether we receive his gift and make it our own. So fear not, little flock, right? Because the shepherd, the good shepherd, has given us the gift of eternal life. In John 10, Jesus says, I give them eternal life. Speaking of the sheep of the flock, the church, you and I, all who believe and love the Lord Jesus Christ for what he freely gives to us. You see how great God is? In that he freely gives to us his gift of salvation. And it would only be human pride and human rebellion that would push it away. But it would be the humility and the gift of faith that we'll receive it and celebrate it. Yes. It is Oktoberfest, isn't it? In the church, 
in this month of October, a time to celebrate, a time to celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ in our lives and in our church and in our world. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever, world without end. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.